Okay, I, I have one short question, uh, uh, which I want a short answer to, to conclude uh, our theme too, and that is this. Does consciousness evolve in gradients, in smooth increments, or does it consciousness in, evolve in discrete steps, something akin to quanta? Short answer from everyone. Uh, start with Michelle. No, I am gonna have to, I'm gonna have to defer that, that answer to Ava. <laughs> okay, Ava. I think it's a very, very difficult question. My tendency is to think that it is, uh, that the, in evolutionary biology, what we very often see is a lot of gray areas. And also we see it in development. I mean, when we're looking at the processes, we can say, well, this, for example, uh, we, we can say, well, this stage of embryogenesis, for example, is a blastula. This state of embryogenesis is a gastrula and so on. Sure. But in between, it's a, it's a continuous process and it's very, very mm -hmm. difficult to define. And in evolutionary biology, we always also have these gray areas. So my tendency is to concentrate on the gray areas because they are very interesting. They, we, cannot define, we, we, we cannot define things there very, very clearly, but this is to some, in some, to some extent the joy of it. It's, uh, it, it, so it, I it. think it's it's I tend to think it's more it's 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 a gradual process, but I do do realize that there are threshold effects too you, in evolution. So one yeah. so, so, you know too little about it. You you have it both ways, Ian. Based on your panpsychism, how would you address that question? You say you're panpsychist, but uh, 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 evolution um, there is an evolution of consciousness. So given that. Is it in discrete aspects or is consciousness a continuous function? Well, most of the evolutionary processes we know can move by quantum leaps. And so I would simply on that basis say that it quite probably could. I mean, what one's got to remember is that when one's talking in, in scientific terms about these incredibly difficult things to ponder, as Neil Spohr said, we're not actually getting at the reality itself, which we never can. What we're doing is seeing how clearly our various concepts hang together. And that, that we're trying to make sense of how our um, concepts hang together. The only thing I would say is that doesn't put me in the same camp, I think, as Donald, who seems to believe that we, our perception makes no contact with anything outside this hermetically sealed box in the head. I, I don't hold that. I believe that um, everything comes out of an encounter between our consciousness and the conscious universe around us. Don, what's your approach to the, uh, based on your approach to consciousness being fundamental, uh, does that mean that it's kind of always there, but as evolution progresses, we see it progressing. Is it in smooth increments or is it akin to quantum? It, well, I, I take consciousness to be ontologically fundamental and I'm not a dualist. So that's all that there is. And the appearance of space and time are merely qualia within consciousness and the brain and the head are merely qualia within consciousness. So consciousness is not trapped inside the head. It creates the head as one of its simple symbols. And the evolution of consciousness on its own terms, I suspect that the projection of it into the space-time format may, discrete mathematics may be fine for that, but that that, that consciousness on its own terms outside of space and time, we may need, um, you know, ALF1 and higher kinds of mathematics, not, not just discrete mathematics to, 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 to deal with it. So we, we know that space time itself has a finite number of states. 10 to the minus 43 seconds and 10 to the minus 33 centimeters is as far down as you can go. So you don't, and that's not very many digits. I mean, if it was 10 to the minus 33 trillion centimeters, I'd be impressed. 10 to the minus 33, I'm not impressed at all. So oh, finite I'm, math. I'm impressed with that. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so okay. it's finite in, in space and time, but consciousness on its own terms as fundamental, may, we may need all orders of infinity to okay. describe. So basically, basically what, what you're saying is that the question I pose based on your um, uh, metaphysics is kind of irrelevant, whether it's smooth or, 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 or in quantum uh, steps is, 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 is irrelevant because consciousness there is fundamental. So the question makes no sense in your metaphysics. Okay, look, I can imagine how conscious responses can be more efficient, as Eva said, than reflex-like behaviors. I agree with that, but I just still cannot imagine how everybody else says how physical mutations alone can engender the required of consciousness. So we're going to go on to theme three. Uh, will we ever 
provide an explanation for consciousness. I think I can almost answer the question from each of you, but I'm, I'm going to let you do it. Uh, and can we even make progress? Uh, Michelle, I want you to weigh the roles of science and philosophy in explaining consciousness. I know your position, but what weigh each one, because some say that science is the only way that we can understand it. Eva is saying that, just like the way we understand life, we'll understand consciousness. Others, of course, the rest of the panel, uh, that science is in principle self-limited. Um, you're, you've sort of said that, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that definitely uh, the latter. I, I don't think that we can explain consciousness in the sense of the origin of consciousness. It's like ask, you know, sort of like asking, you know, why does matter exist? You know, we got to ask God. I don't think we're going to um, answer that question. I do think we can make progress um, studying consciousness, but not necessarily by looking to science, but rather by looking to phenomenology, the, the study of conscious experience as we have it. And by studying it and paying very careful attention to how consciousness appears to us, we might make some progress in understanding its structure and develop new concepts to describe it more adequately. So in that sense, I do think we can make progress. Okay, Ian, uh, you champion the view that the humanities contribute to human understanding in ways that the sciences in principle can never do. Uh, to defend this view, do you need consciousness to be any way non-physical? So I'm asking you to take your the position that, that you presented so uh, wonderfully in your books and, and ask whether your sense that consciousness is a, a, an ontological primitive as, as a pantheist, is that a required position in order to defend the importance of the humanities? Well, the, I'm not saying by reading the humanities you solve the problem of consciousness. No, I, don't, I don't think we can come to that at all, um, whatever we do. And there are certain things that science, I mean, love is a very real experience um, and you only know it when you've had it. But it's something that science can only refer to um, physical correlates of um, rather in, ineffectively, actually, um, even that. But it's not the same as knowing what love actually is. And the same is true of consciousness. It's a subjective phenomenon. And as such, it's not open to the kind of science. Um, that, that that I think is being um, required. I think, it, like uh, Michelle, I think that a phenomenological approach is the only one that will get us in any way closer. But I think that actually we're as close already as we can get. Hmm. Uh, but your, your view of the importance of the humanities to human understanding, um, let, let me just pose, if you were convinced that consciousness was entirely physical, that Eva with her arguments has convinced you. Uh, th would that change your approach to the humanity? I'm trying to see if we can dissect out your approach to the humanities as, as contributing to human understanding from your sense of what consciousness is. So uh, the thought experiment, hypothetically, Eva has convinced you that consciousness is 100% physical, like life is physical. Would that affect your approach to the humanities? <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a big counterfactual, but uh, it wouldn't affect my approach because in the end, what one knows about the humanities is from experience. And what one knows is that it enormously enriches one's consciousness. Without it, one, one is aware of and experiences less, less rich world. So it's part of the enrichment of experience is to, is to take in these elements, which which give you, if nothing else, they give you some skepticism about what science can answer. I mean, I'm a huge, I, I, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, you know, I, I, I'm always defending science because I am a scientist and I've benefited from it all my life, but it can't answer all our questions. This is just the kind of question it can't answer. Don, you believe that science can never make progress, never, within a, a materialist, physicalist framework. But if you start with consciousness as your ontological primitive, isn't your conclusion just your premise? Uh, well, no. So with, with a theory in which consciousness is fundamental, 
uh, you have to have a, a specific dynamics that you write down and you have to show how space and time, quantum field theory, general relativity and evolution of natural selection come out as a special projection of that deeper theory. If I cannot do that, then there's no reason to take my theory seriously. So there's there are strong conditions, scientific theoretical conditions on on the claim that that consciousness is fundamental. If you cannot predict scattering amplitudes at the Large Hadron Collider, your theory should not be taken seriously. So that's what we have to do. I, I'd say you have a long, uh, long road ahead of you. Uh, Eva. Well, it's gonna, yeah, not before lunch. I just want to say, I'm not, an, neither myself nor anybody who knows any, uh, any neuroscience is a naive realist. So it's not as if uh, we're not, we're, it, it, it's phenomenology is uh, absolutely, uh, it's part and parcel of the view of the, of my view and most uh, scientists that I know view of uh, what reality is. There is a very famous uh, uh, I, what, what is we cannot understand the way that I see it is that we that consciousness occurs like most things in this world in a realm of interactions, the interactions between some aspects of the world. Some, as, uh, some aspects of the brain and some aspects of receptors that we have of the body. Okay. There is a very famous, there is a very famous haiku uh, by Ikkyo Sojun that says, uh, uh, oh, green, green willow, wonderfully red flower, but I know the colors are not there. And of course the colors are not there. They are, they, they are not there independently of the brain. They are not there independently of the receptors and they are not there independently uh, of, of of some properties of the physical world. The third okay. third person knowledge can be, become first person knowledge only if it, we implement it within our brains. I always conclude consciousness uh, discussions the, the same way. While I'm I always appreciate more and more the deeper and richer issues and questions. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.